Greetings, comrades! As you know, on this channel we talk about things related to Russia, the USSR or the Russian Empire. But you have to agree that for almost half of the last century the Soviet Union's influence extended far beyond its borders. And many of the things created in the countries of the socialist camp in those years were in one way or another very much inspired by the Soviet proletarian way of life. Today we are going to talk about a really unique product. A car which was able to beat Moskvich, Zaporozhets and Lada combined in terms of a number of jokes and taunts about it. The great and terrible Travon. A disgusting belch of communism. A plastic bucket. A smoking disaster. A spark plug with a roof. These were the epithets you could hear about this car in the late 80s, especially after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Tired of decades of living under restrictions and taboos, East Germans were glad to get rid of anything that reminded them of socialist life, and the Trabant was one of the most prominent things that represented socialism. Our unsightly answer to the people's car, the Volkswagen. And the people of other socialist countries look at this unattractive car with a kind of bewilderment. The GDR was rightly considered a showcase of socialism, which got the best of everything. And could it be that in 40 years of automobile production the best specialists of the Eastern Bloc were only capable of making… this? But let's not throw mud at Trabant today. It has been done many times before me. Today I will tell you why the Trabant was not as bad as it's usually thought. The Trabant does indeed carry the honorary title of the worst car ever made. But then how do you explain the fact that the factory always had a 10 to 13 year wait list for prospective new buyers? Ok, fine, it is possible to explain this. The shortage of cars was not unique to the Soviet Union. But in order to fully understand the love-hate relationship Germans have with this car, we need to go to the 1950s. The birthplace of the Trabant is Zwickau, the city known for its coal mines and the Audi and Horch automobile factories. Before the Second World War, these brands were part of the Auto Union Group. In 1945, all these enterprises were in the Soviet occupation zone and were nationalized. For a while, pre-war vehicles were produced here. For example, the IFA F8, presented the Leipzig Trade Fair in 1948, was actually a copy of the pre-war DKV F8. And then the company began to develop its own models. Well, about their own. The Trabant looked suspiciously similar to all those small cars made by DKV. By the way, fun fact, DKV small cars got to the Soviet Union as trophies after World War II and very soon got their own cute nicknames. For example, DKV stood for either Durak to Vidumol, the fool who invented this, or Derevo Klei Vada, Wood Glue Water, hinting at what these cars were made of. In general, you can see why the air turned out the way it did. Actually, why did it appear at all? Well, here everything is very simple. As an answer to the Volkswagen Beetle, which emerged in the early 50s. And yes, initially it was met with contempt too. This vehicle does not meet even the minimal technical requirements for anything claiming to be called a car, and to produce it would be madness. This is not a review on the Trabant, but the words of the head of a British car company about the possibility of mass production of the Volkswagen Beetle. In general, the GDR authorities faced a dilemma in the mid-1950s. It was necessary not to lose face and produce a powerful answer to the Western neighbors. But there was practically no steel in the country. The traditional suppliers of iron ore remained abroad – Poland and West Germany. The Soviet Union was not going to waste metal on East German civilian cars either. There were more important things to do with the emerging space race. Fiberglass. But after all, molding fiberglass parts was a complicated and damn time-consuming process, cost-effective only for small-scale production. The solution was found quickly. Duroplast. A plastic that was made from textile waste, scraps of fabric and phenol. The resulting structure was light, inexpensive and strong enough to be stamped, unlike fiberglass. Ideal for mass production in a country that was recovering from the worst of the shocks. Duraplast was the only truly unique thing in the car. For example, the Trabant's two-stroke engine was an evolution of the pre-war DKV motors. 17 mighty horsepower, BMW and Mercedes be afraid. 
In general, after solving the problem with the bodies, everything else went quite smoothly. And already in 1957 a prototype of a new socialist people's car was presented to the public. And at that time a lot was really expected of this car, because in 1957 the Soviets were winning the space race with Sputnik reaching space. So they knew a lot about technology, didn't they? By the way, even the name of the car is derived from the Middle High German word Drabant, which means companion, so basically Sputnik. In general, in 1957 the release of Trabant P50 was met with at least optimism. What can the German engineers offer us? A two-stroke engine outdated almost at the time of its release. Questionable design. Some absolutely hellish levels of noise and emissions from such a tiny engine. Plastic body, leaving the driver little chance to survive at speeds above 50 km per hour. That's the car I'm going to defend today. Yes, I'm not taking the easy way out. Let's take it one step at a time. First, the plastic car was not exactly plastic. In fact, contrary to rumors, this car was built on a classic platform, welded from steel stampings on which the plastic elements, doors, fenders and roof were put. So its chassis was not plastic, of course, but made of steel imported from the USSR in Poland. Second, the miniature Trabi, due to its design features, weighed only 620 kg. For comparison, a tiny Soviet Zaporozhets 968 weighed 800 kg, the first Lada model weighed 955 kg, and a modern B-class car such as the Kia Rio weighs about 1150 kg. Thanks to its lightness, the Trabant had good dynamics. Again, with a 17 horsepower engine, the Trabant was able to reach 90 km per hour. That's pretty cool. The Trabi had a total of 5 moving parts in a 2 cylinder, 2 stroke engine. 5. There was simply nothing to break there, and in case of need, it could be repaired even in the open field with a screwdriver. If the dynamics of the Trabant was just acceptable for its time, everything else was practically on the cutting edge of the automobile construction of the mid-1950s, especially in the budget segment. Look, independent all-wheel suspension, rack and pinion steering, front-wheel drive… Not bad for 1957. The car had a pretty innovative layout with a transverse arrangement of the engine and the main gear located between it and the twin shaft gearbox. Subsequently, this scheme became generally accepted and is now dominant in the global automotive industry, but back then the front-wheel drive with the transverse arrangement of the power unit was used only on the Swedish Saab cars outside the GDR. The car steered very easily and comfortably. And that's not even talking about the versions of Trabant with the semi-automatic gearbox. Yes, half a century before the appearance of the magnificent and dreadful DSG. Design? It would only become absurd and ridiculous in the 90s. Three decades earlier there was nothing wrong with it. Of course there were better looking cars, but look at something like the Izetta or Messerschmitt. <laughs> Still laughing at the design of the Trabant? The Trabant P50 looked like a proper car without any discounts a full-fledged four-seater interior and adequate trunk. The body was not afraid of corrosion, fuel consumption did not exceed 6.7 liters per 100 km, and the favorable price completed the picture. In the first few years of its conveyor life, it was selling well even in the countries of Western Europe. If people bought it even in Western Europe, imagine the furor it caused at home. The Trabant was cheaper than anything offered by the industry of the Warsaw Bloc countries, and at the same time it was the most reliable and long-lasting car. For example, in 1976 a basic Trabant in the GDR cost 7170 Eastern Marks. Similar in consumer qualities, Zas 968 was almost twice as expensive – 12000. Four-door and also plastic Wardberg was sold at 16,800, and basic Lada Vaz 2101 with 1.2 liter engine was almost 19,000. According to service of GDR motorists, the average lifetime of a Trabant was 28 years. 28! An eternal car! And it was this everlastingness that eventually ruined it. 
the Treban P50 was quickly followed by the P60 and then the P601, which subsequently sold almost 3 million models. Then came the prototype P602 in a hatchback body, P603, a three-door hatchback with a 55-horsepower rotary piston engine. It seemed that on the wave of success of the release of the Treban, they would make a successful and prosperous brand out of it. But no. And why not? Because of the planned economy and German functionaries. At first, Gunter Mittek, who was responsible for the economy of the GDR at that time, suddenly decided that instead of producing the P603 model, it was worth trying to establish a joint German-Czech production with the participation of the engineers of Trabant, Wurzburg and Škoda. Spoiler alert, it did not work out, while well, the development of the promising 603 model was frozen. Even throughout the 60s and 70s, the GDR could not produce Trabants in the volumes demanded by the market. At the best of times, up to 150,000 sedans and station wagons left the factory in Zwickau annually, but that was not enough. Demand was higher, it seemed necessary to increase production, but for what? In a planned economy, expanding production is an expensive and unnecessary luxury. Why invest in increased production or modernization of the model if the queue for the car is already stretched out for years to come? I repeat, 10 to 13 years. So what now? People queue for one model and get it in three generations. Why? It is fine as it is. As a result, second-hand Trabants were almost 40% more expensive than new ones. The same situation as in the 70s with cars in the USSR. Germans were willing to pay extra just to buy a car right now, and not in 10 years. It was the absence of competition and unwillingness to change anything that ruined the Trabant. It was a fine car for the early 60s, even with its 26 horsepower on a good day, but if you produce something unchanged for 30 years, anything will turn into a joke. And yes, the Lada Niva is the exception that proves the rule. But even at the end of its life, the Trabant was not as bad as is commonly thought. The analysis of crash tests of Trabant and its classmates, including Renault Twingo, Daihatsu Kyore, Fiat 500, showed that in terms of passive safety, German Sputnik was not inferior to microcars of the 80s 90s. It was still good to drive, reliable and economical. All the hatred he encountered after the fall of the Berlin Wall was not hatred for him, but hatred for the socialist regime. And the Germans overcame it rather quickly. Now the Trabant is actually an iconic car, the object of nostalgic memories. About 58,000 Trabis can still be driven on the roads of Europe. And for only 60 to 80 euros, you can take a Trabant ride through the streets of Berlin and Dresden in an unforgettable hour and a half tour. In fact, what's stopping you from buying this car? True, you will have to put up with the absence of the tachometer arrow, turn signal indicators, headlight indicators, and rear seat bells. Also, there's no fuel hatch and no fuel gauge. You have to fill the fuel directly into the gas tank, located under the hood cover, and manually mix the gasoline and oil, and then constantly measure the fuel level manually with a plastic measuring stick. But what an amazing experience! By the way, the iconic cars were almost revived in Uzbekistan. In 1997, the Uzbek plant Olymp bought the license to produce Trabant, and also most of the equipment necessary from the factory in Tsvikau. Unfortunately, something went wrong, and exactly one car was produced, which went to the president of the Tashkent Automobile Federation. It is impossible not to mention, perhaps, the main enthusiast of Trabants, Czech journalist and traveler Dan Prichban, who has been around almost the entire world, South America, Africa and Australia on yellow Trabants. And if we consider the phenomenal survivability of these small cars, it is quite possible that we will be able to observe them on the move for many more decades. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you didn't mind my little digression from the usual topics. As always, a huge shout out to my biggest supporters. Stick to one, Steven, Elizabeth Zaharova, Kirill Klimuk, Zimon Berze, Jordan Lamotte, Jimmy Albin and Ellie. See you guys next time. Next video will be Soviet, I promise.